Hello, this week we will be talking about East Asia. So I want to use this lecture to talk a little bit about um, development in East Asia. I'm going to start with looking at your student impressions of this world region. As you can see, China and Japan uh, loom large in your conceptions of the area. Um, large populations come up again. You see overpopulated, populous, those sorts of things. Um, the idea of uh, technology, city, and culture, uh, manufacturing is in there as well. Um, so really a lot of um, sort of ideas about development for right now. We also have this uh, area looming large in sort of the imagination of Americans in terms of understanding um, development and the shifting of the new international division of labor around the world in, for example, the last political election. Um, both candidates really um, took the time to talk tough about um, China and the perceived loss of American jobs to this part of the world. So we're going to talk a little bit about the developments that led to this new international division of labor and the increase of manufacturing in Japan and China specifically. So we're going to focus on the two strategies that these different countries have used for development. Um, in Japan, we have what you can call state-assisted capitalism, and in China, a socialist market economy. And we're going to look at each one of those things in turn. I want to go back to this chart for a second um, from the early parts of class where we were thinking about how um, GDP is split up around the world. And this chart has um, time along the horizontal axis and along the vertical axis percentage of the world's economy, percentage of the world's total GDP over the last 500 years. So um, the red part of the bar, um, you'll notice, is uh, about 25% early on back in the 1500s, you know, a really large section of the world's economy, and that's been historically um, China's economy. It wasn't until the 1850s and the Industrial Revolution and the increase of uh, European colonial power um, through the rest of the world that you see China's share of world GDP begin to diminish to probably its lowest point in about the 1950s then you see that um, beginning to grow again. Um, we can also see Japan's share. Um, it's in the turquoise. It's around the middle of the overall bars. So you can see it's a, a fairly small but, uh, but steady share of the world's economy, and it really began to grow in the 1950s. And uh, we'll talk about those things here in a second. Let this chart help you keep in mind that the world's economy has changed over time and East Asia has long played a prominent role in uh, the overall wealth created in the world. So maybe the new industrial uh, division of labor isn't really new, it's just the most recent version of So in the context of Japan, um, you can read in your book about uh, Japan's history of feudalism and then imperialism. It's important to keep in mind Japanese imperialism and um, you know, sort of overall military aggression. And you'll see that in continued uh, tensions and um, relations to other countries in East Asia who have um, a lot of animosity remaining towards Japan from uh, their own past imperialism. Um, but you can read about those things in your book. And what I'm going to talk about today is state-assisted capitalism in Japan. So we can look at Japan's Industrial Revolution in happening in the late 1800s. And this, again, is tied to um, Japanese imperialism and a decision to try to improve heavy industry uh, infrastructure, education, and agriculture throughout the country. Japan overall has fairly limited resources. You know, being an island, um, not having access to a lot of um, new land and resources that way. So one of the things that um, it did during this time was to try to expand, you know, into um, 
the continent of Asia, so into the Korean Peninsula, um, into parts of China as well. Um, so this military aggression also helped fuel um, industry as well. Um, a big factor that helped Japan industrialize was its exports of silk as a commodity that was desired throughout the world. So they were able to gain a lot of um, monetary wealth from that and to use that um, to develop the country. So this was a really successful um, strategy and by 1920 Japan became a core nation of the world and if you remember back to looking at our core and periphery model, um, Japan remains a sort of uh, one of the core points for East Asia. Of course, Japan's uh, imperial intentions um, got them into uh, conflict with World War II, and uh, again, you know, you can read about that in your book. But what is really interesting is after this defeat in World War II, that Japan had incredible economic growth, what's been termed an economic miracle of about 10% growth per year. And by 1963, Japan became the world's leading manufacturing nation, surpassing the United States. Um, they were really able to uh, capitalize on new technology, um, sort of cultural values within the society where folks had really high levels of personal um, savings, um, a lot of government support, again, that idea of state-assisted capitalism. So the government was um, very supportive in terms of protecting specific strategic markets that they thought um, would be the best to grow. So in a way, it's kind of like an import substitution strategy where strategic markets were chosen with a lot of investment. The Japanese really um, changed how business was done. Um, we talked about the idea of the new economy having these networks of various businesses rather than having everything done in-house in one large corporation. Um, that was really something that was developed in Japan by the Koretsu sort of system of business networks. So you have um, people that are sort of closely linked often through um, family ties with this high level of trust that they would be able to deliver um, products. And so this worked really well. You can see in some of the specific commodities here in these charts. So um, car production, you see by 1970, uh, Japan has really taken off and actually surpasses the US in car production um, by the 1980s. Um, and then you can see in TV sets below that, again, uh, Japan surpassing the United States in uh, by the 1970s in that sort of production. And it's really interesting because back during that time, there was uh, very much a, a sort of concern about this shift in the American uh, market in terms of jobs moving over to Japan. And you see that same sort of concern with people's thoughts about China today. Here's just a, a visual example of putting um, that new technology to work in the manufacturing process, um, automating some of the process itself, so building new infrastructure and using advanced technology to build automobiles you know, as efficiently as possible. And that's one of the other ways that Japanese cars were able to compete is because they actually were higher quality than um, American cars at the time because of these efficiencies and in innovation in production. So with this large growth in um, Japan's overall economy, uh, one of the things that they were able to do is to sort of spread investment to other parts of Asia. And Asia overall saw this really great economic boom to the point that economists were calling these countries Asian tigers. So these were recently industrialized countries that had experienced rapid economic growth. So in some of these places there was a, a transition from being uh, periphery countries, so fairly um, poor countries, to uh, semi-periphery, so much more integrated with the global economy within just a generation. So with that, huge differences in um, culture and urbanization, those sorts of things. Again, you see state-assisted capitalism in these places and 
different areas taking specific niche roles within the world economy. And we talked about kind of niche markets and we've heard about that before um, in relation to a lot of primary commodities that don't generate a lot of wealth. But some of these specialized roles um, are much more focused on um, high value goods like things like cars, electronics, that kind of stuff. So if we then look at modern East Asian economies, um, Japan was the second most eco powerful economy in the world and had a lot of links again to other um, parts of Asia where they had made investments. You can actually see this notion of um, so disinvestment from Japan as manufacturing moves to China and then other parts of Asia where it's cheaper. But China's actually become the second largest economy at this point with a lot of potential to be part of the core, um, especially because of its lar large population, so they're able to draw on a lot of labor power and keep prices low because of this large population. Some of the other Asian tigers include Hong Kong, South Korea, and um, Taiwan. But if we look at things like um, the average sort of GNI per capita, we see there's really a great difference in China um, having um, per capita incomes of about $6,000 a year, um, really high incomes in places like Hong Kong and Japan over $30,000 a year, South Korea for $21,000 a year. Um, life expectancies, you know, at other development indica indicators quite good across most of the region. But one of the things that sticks out here is the percentage of the population living on less than $2 a day as of 2006, and in China, that was 47% of the population, so nearly half the population living in this extreme poverty. So you see a real um, divergence, and we'll talk about that here in a second when we talk about development in China. Modern development in China can really be linked to the late 1970s, and Deng Xiaoping was the leader at the time. Um, the idea was to um, use what was called the four modernization, uh, four modernization, so industry, agriculture, science, and defense, and sort of um, focus on these as a way to gradually have the economy grow and use Western science, technology, and trade um, to improve China's economy overall. There was a decentralization of planning. You know, China is a communist country, and as you read in your book before that, had uh, central planning and command economy uh, as their way of uh, developing. But under Deng Xiaoping, you had decentralization, a switch to a market-based economy, uh, the encouragement of private entrepreneurship, an open door policy to um, outside investment coming in. And so you see huge growth, manufacturing growing by 15% a year through the 80s and 90s. You also have the normalization of uh, trade relations with, between China and other parts of the world and China becoming a member of the World Trade Organization. So what you see then in terms of production is you see a huge increase in trade volume, especially with the United States. Um, one of the big driving forces of this is again that low cost of labor. You have such a large population that uh, wages can remain low. Um, but what this tends to be for people's everyday lives that are workers is long hours without benefits and a lot of the working population is, are young women who are new to uh, the waged labor market. You know, many of them are rural migrants coming from uh, rural areas to the cities to work in factories for the first time. You see a lot of multinational corporations coming in looking for opportunities in the Chinese market. So not only to um, use the area for production, but as China's middle class expands, as more people are doing waged work and are able to um, buy commodities, corporations want to sell to this huge market that's going to be the Chinese middle class. Um, a lot of investment is from other East Asian countries, um, and you see that creative destruction as manufacturing pulls out of Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan and moves to China. Um, we see below some of the new web of trade interdependencies. So a lot of this growth is focused on the coastal areas of China and linked with um, other areas around the Pacific especially. So a lot of um, stuff going to uh, Singapore, Bangkok, Kuala Lumpur, Los Angeles, and Vancouver.